So this is the chapter overview video for chapter 15, oscillations. This is the first chapter in the unit 2 of our, of our textbook. The University Physics Volume 1 has two units. The first unit was mechanics, and we kind of skipped on fluid mechanics. We'll come back to that later. Um, and now we are in unit 2, waves and acoustics. I like to call it application of mechanics. But in any case, uh, we are in the first chapter, oscillations. This is the chapter that introduces a lot of the terminology that you will be using when we do waves and sound as well. So it's worth paying attention to. Um, so it has six sections. In terms of your homework, we really don't uh, put a lot of emphasis on the last two sections, 15.5 and 15.6 covering damped and uh, damped and driven oscillators. Uh, I do have some lecture videos on that as a way of making use of uh, complex exponentials that I introduced in the lecture. Um, you have seen me cover, you will see me cover some of these, but in terms of your homework questions, you can skip out on sections 15.5 and 15.6. Um, but um, if you want to follow that complex exponential approach, I do recommend to kind of comparing your textbook's approach to mine. So, it starts with the section 15.1. It's a really long section that does everything. <laughs> it introduces terminology. Uh, it gives you some uh, conceptual kind of um, description of simple harmonic motion, you know, with the characteristics of simple harmonic motion. And one of the... Um, so it follows from Hooke's law, you know, where there's a net force proportional to displacement. It's describing a Hooke's law. And when you have a Hooke's law type uh, motion force, it leads to simple harmonic oscillator, where the key feature of that is that the, yeah, the frequency and the period, which are tied, uh, they are independent of amplitude. And you kind of saw an illustration of this in our very first lab of the semester with the pendulum. Uh, there's a section for that. Pendulum can be modeled as a simple harmonic oscillator. So, so your textbook starts out with that uh, conceptual description of simple harmonic oscillator motion. We do the same thing in lecture. And then it talks about the equations of a simple harmonic oscillator motion. And I think your textbook does it a little bit differently. Um, yeah. It, gives you these um, solutions first, and then, you know, you hear me say solution. Solution to what? Solution to the equation of motion. And I think, though, so this is where your textbook approach and my approach is a little bit different. Um, I like to introduce equation of motion first. I think uh, uh, we might have talked about how the motion looks like a sinusoidal thing, but uh, in lecture, I don't like to spend a lot of time on that until we introduce the equation of motion. So, uh, but your textbook goes through these kinematics equations. All right, fine, <laughs> nothing there. Um, so once you know the position, then you can take the, uh, um, and the, in more general term, there may be a phase shift. So this is a more general expression for position. And once you have that, then you can take the derivative of it with respect to time to get velocity, do that one more time to get acceleration. And there's a lot of um, kind of nice comparisons you can make with how this uh, position function uh, compares to, say, the acceleration function. Uh, so, so, yeah. And your textbook calls these equations of motion for simple harmonic oscillator. Um, so when I say equation of motion, I'm not referring to this. I'm talking about the equation of uh, motion. And there's a, this is a pretty standard term when you are in like analytical mechanics. I hate to, you know, refer to Wikipedia and use it as a source because, you know, citing Wikipedia to win arguments is kind of <laughs> whatever. But um, there's a kind of formal usage of the word equation of motion. Usually we are referring to a differential equation, a second order differential equation that incorporates a physical law. And uh, so, so when I say equation of motion or the equation of motion, I'm referring to that. Uh, a differential equation that basically characterizes the, the system. 
Um, so you, you, you'll see the introduction to the equation of motion in, in the lecture, and your textbook does it too. It just doesn't carefully distinguish between what it calls the equation of motion, the second order differential equation, and these formulas, the formulas that you can easily drive yourself. Uh, equation of motion, I guess you could drive it yourself too, but there's a kind of first principles, a fundamental approach to it. So the equation of motion, it follows from what your textbook is going through here. You know, Hooke's law. You write one side using Newton's second law, mass times acceleration, and using kinematics, you rewrite acceleration as second order time derivative of position. And, um, and uh, kind of, you can put this equation into a standard form. You solve it for the highest order de derivative. Then this is what I call the equation of motion. The differential equation, in this case, second order differential equation, that characterizes the motion of the system. Once you find the solution, that's the sense in which I was talking about solution. Once you find the solution to this, you have solved the system. You know, um, given an initial condition, um, you know all the future motions of the system. That's what equation of motion tells you. Um, given some particular state at a moment in time, how do you get the next moment in time? That's what the the time derivatives tell you. It tells you to how to evolve the system as a function of time. So anyways, um, your textbook does introduce the equation of motion, just doesn't give, give appropriate emphasis to it. Um, and then um, now, so, so I, I prefer the approach I do in lecture, because I think uh, here, um, uh, so, you know, they are substituting in the equations of motion for x, okay, which you can do. Um, but I like to think of it as a, a kind of a guess and check step for trying to figure out what would be a solution to this. Because in your differential equations class, you will have a more systematic approach for actually solving it. But in this uh, physics class, we are basically doing guess and check. And at the level of math that we require, where you might not be taking differential equations for another year or so. Um, we are limited to uh, guess and check methods, uh, especially to solve second order differential equation. And you will see that covered in lecture. Uh, now, do, going through this exercise actually does give you one thing, which is the angular frequency for the system. Uh, if you have ever like given had this given to you as a formula, omega is equal to square root of k over m, this is how to derive it. You derive it by plugging in the solution to the differential equation, solution to the equation of motion into the equation of motion. Then you find that um, that it can be a solution, but if and only if the omega is this particular value. So because you know omega squared has to be equal to k over m. Um, and uh, using the definition of angular frequency as a function of, uh, in terms of t pre period, you can solve it both period. And all these are formulas that uh, you can drive on the spot. You don't have to worry about memorizing it. Um, and it does covers vertical motion. I guess all the lecture examples we use are vertical motion, but we don't. Um, um, I, I guess the main thing is the kind of the offset thing. Um, all right. I think I've done a version of that when I justified how to treat a vertical spring as a, uh, like treat the combined gravitational force and the spring force as one quote unquote spring force. So, um, so that was covered in lecture. Uh, so that's all that, uh, long section. So do make sure to take your time and, um, uh, where necessary compared with the lecture. Most of the approaches are similar. The only biggest one difference is the, how you treat equation of motion. Energy in simple harmonic motion, um, yeah, I think uh, kind of energy is conserved and you can kind of relate the amplitude to kinetic energy and all that, um, read through it. I, I don't think in the lecture I really talk about it because uh, it's, uh, you know, application of mechanical principles. I think you understand about um, <laughs> conservation of energy, applying to simple harmonic motion. It's pretty simple, easy. Uh, one thing to highlight, it kind of goes to why uh, simple harmonic oscillator, simple harmonic motion is something we emphasize so much. Uh, you're going to see it in this class. 
And for those of you who take Physics 4C, you'll see it in Physics 4C. And the reason for that is this subsection here, oscillations about an equilibrium position. It comes down to whenever you have a system that has an equilibrium and it's a stable equilibrium, whenever you move away from the position, the for restoring force will tend to restore you back to that position. And this is an example of a simple harmonic oscillator potential. But you can think about basically any other potential, maybe a um, kind of a marble in a bowl, or I thought I saw some other example. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, like um, a model of a, a, a molecule being bound with uh, van der Waals interaction or something. I don't know. Something that might come up in chemistry. So this is a kind of, you can think of this as, a, as on any arbitrary uh, potential with a stable equilibrium. And as long as you're considering small displacement about this equilibrium, you can treat, think of this like a simple harmonic oscillator. You can think of these restoring forces like a spring force. So, so and, and all of this comes from this kind of um, the Taylor expansion, or I guess here, here binomial expansion, um, because basically any kind of example of uh, stable equilibrium can be tr uh, turned into an approximate simple harmonic oscillator. That's why simple harmonic oscillator is such an important example. A lot of things you might learn about a simple harmonic motion, you can apply to apply them to those uh, situations with approximation that your displacements are small. So, so yeah, I think that's uh, more or less it. There's more formulas that they drive that you can do yourself. Uh, section 15.3, um, read it if you want. You can also skip it. I guess it's a mathematical curiosity. I don't put a lot of time into it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in a circular motion, there's cosines and sines involved. Um, we also have cosines and sines involved in simple harmonic motion, so you can kind of compare them, you can connect them, but I don't see much of physical connection, that's why you don't see me really focusing on it, but do, you know, read through it, I don't think there's any harm in it. Pendulum is an interesting system. You've seen simple pendulum, and what it is, is a, it's, a, it's a, one of those systems, as I was talking about up there, that can be approximated as a simple harmonic motion. If you are treating pendulum in its a full swing at an arbitrarily large angle oscillation, it you won't be able to make it into a simple harmonic oscillator in the sense of the the frequency of oscillation being independent of the amplitude at large enough swing, it the, it'll depend on the amplitude. But um, a lot of the pendulum operated the small angles, so if you use small angle approximation here, then you can simplify this equation of motion, which has this ugly sine theta, you know, <laughs> in most advanced calculus. But under simple, uh, sim under small angle approximation, you can approximate this equation into this, which looks a lot like the equation of motion you saw earlier. So the similar kind of solution applies, and the uh, and uh, you, you, you applying the same methods, you figure out, oh, angular, um, angular, uh, angular frequency, not to be confused with the first time derivative of theta there. You have to really separate your physical angle, uh, which will be the first time derivative of theta, with your phase angle, which it will be related to the angular frequency here. Anyways, angular frequency of a pendulum motion, square root of g over l, and you can to the similar derivation for the period. So pendulum is a, a great system to kind of think of application of um, simple harmonic oscillator. Physical pendulum, we don't spend a lot of time in it. Do read it through it so you know how to handle it. This is where you think about an ex extended uh, body. Um, you have to basically deal with the rotational inertia of the thing. And uh, you can see the derivation here, what that looks like. Um, uh, we don't really deal with it, so um, you won't really see this in homework questions. Um, and torsion pendulum, skip it. Uh, we don't deal with it at all. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's a, also, it's a, uh, useful to know. Uh, tor torsion pendulum. I think you saw uh, Kevin this experiment uses the torsion pendulum setup. So you know, do skim it, don't skip it. But you won't see any homework questions. Damped and forced oscillations. 
So textbook approach is useful, I think, for two things. One, uh, just looking at the the derivation of the equation of motion. You know, okay, this is the equation of motion, and uh, the solution that they cite. Now, uh, they don't actually show you the solution because actually solving for this with the approach your textbook uses with the real functions gets really complicated. So yeah, uh, your, so your textbook will just throw the solution at you. If you want to see how you might be able to drive it, watch the lecture. So in lecture, I actually introduced something called a complex exponential. That's a little bit outside of the standard curriculum for Physics 4A. So there's more material there that you can take a look at. And using complex exponential, you can drive this a lot more easily than you might with the real functions. So, um, so dent oscillations, yeah, your textbook just throws these formulas at you, which you can memorize or get, not, not bother with. <laughs> um, if you use, um, the, if you use the complex exponential approach, you can drive this yourself much more easily. Oh, the one thing that uh, might be worth not skipping is the descriptions of underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped systems and some of the conditions that rises to it. I don't think there's any homework question that relates to it, but it's the kind of thing that uh, like a mechanical engineer should be familiar with. So do skim it and uh, read these descriptions. Um, and the forced oscillations, you're going to see a much better example um, system of forced oscillations in physics 4B with the driven AC circuit. So um, you can skip it, skim it. Uh, I don't think, uh, again, I have any homework questions relating to it. I do have a lecture that drives some of the relationships here. So um, using complex exponential, your equation of motion will have to change a little bit to express the driving force with a complex exponential rather than a real function. And uh, uh, I think this is what I drive. Um, I do drive the expected amplitude out of a driving force. Again, using complex exponential. Uh, if you're interested in the mathematical approach, watch the lectures. If you're not interested, it's completely optional. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's it. Uh, so pay particular attention to section 15.1 because it covers a lot and um, the rest the kind of um, similar approaches the lecture pendulum I think is an interesting example for you to look at.